Welcome to NextGen Mentoring Forum. The NextGen Mentoring Forum series is to empower, educate, and illuminate individuals who are or interested in the financial planning profession. At each forum, an expert will discuss the topic in the field of financial planning with the purpose of inspiring critical thoughts and discussions. In today's session, I have the honor to interview Jennifer Baccarella, or Jenny, uh, on the topic of how to leverage center of influence and referrals to grow your practice. My name is Dr. Jolly Jen. I am an assistant professor and the director of the financial planning program at California Lutheran University. I maintain an active financial planning practice specializing in succession program management at Value Growth Institute. I've offered, authored three award-winning books, most recent peer-reviewed research book published by Pelgrim Macmillan titled Enhancing Retirement Success Rates in United States. Next Gen Mentoring Forum is sponsored by California Lutheran University School of Management Financial Planning Program. We offer financial planning that helps financial advisors pursue a leadership position and grow their financial planning practice. By deploying advanced financial planning, effective client communication, client counseling, streamline practice management, as well as leveraging FinTech. I am honored today to have Jenny um, for today's interview. Jenny and I both serve on the Women in Financial Services National Board. Jenny is an accredited investment fiduciary, AIF, and certified wealth strategist. Plus, she has tons of FINRA licenses in series 7, 24, 63, 65, and 99. Jenny is a wonder woman. If it's important to you, it's important to Jenny. In, that's her infamous line. Jenny has recruited more than a thousand company representatives, orchestrated two clearing uh, firms changes and started a new broker dealer firm. She manages a staff of 115 along with her three team department, which includes licensing, firm development, relationships. She is also the head of the team building committee and manage her own book of business. Jenny is a Girl Scout Dan mother and a member of Women in Financial Services. So welcome Jenny, really have a very nice to have you here today. You are muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> it's the infamous line, you know, from 2020, 2021, you are muted. <laughs> right, right. I, I know that um, I've heard so many fabulous stories from you uh, when we serve on the board meetings and, and things like that. So I really very excited to, for today's session. So um, could you tell us a little bit about where did you grow, grow up? Oh, definitely. Um, I grew up in Monroe, Michigan, which anybody from Michigan puts their hand up because um, it's shaped like a mitten. And then we point to where, where we live. So I was almost on the Ohio border and uh, grew up there and then went to college not too far from there at Siena Heights in University in Adrian, Michigan. And, and how did you go by um, in terms of you know, a lot of people navigate into the financial service and financial planning industry. How did you come about into this particular industry? And I remember you have mentioned that you started, you probably started at the time that you and your husband started in this business. So tell us about a little bit of background in that area. 
Yeah, definitely. When I was in college, I was actually going to school to be a CPA. Um, I've loved money um, since I can, can remember. And uh, I'm very good with, with numbers. And I attributed that to my mother. And uh, so being a CPA was just like my direct route. That was what everybody told me that I should be. So my sophomore year at college, I started interning at a CPA firm, which is what you know they encourage us to do when we when we get into that so end of the sophomore year. And uh, I had uh, truck drivers as my clients, so they would bring in their toll receipts and their gas receipts and food and things like that. And and any time they came into the office, I went running out there and was like, "Hey, where'd you go? And you know, what were the things you hauled?" And I would ask them all these questions. And uh, the one of the lead partners pulled me aside and he said, um, you're not going to make it as a CPA. And I was just completely destroyed because this was what my life's passion. This is what everybody had told me that that I would be great at. And he said, you kind of make us all look bad, like you're out there chatting everybody up, you know, being extra social. And he said, you know, I actually think, you know, I'm registered with Raymond James as an investment advisor. And he's like, I think you should use your skills more on the side of being in um, the side of advice because he's like, you love relationships, obviously. You love numbers and being able to do those analytics. But he's like, I think being a CPA is, is not the right path for you. And I, you know, he uh, was my mentor really early on. Um, he helped me get registered at the age of 20 and um, taught me a lot of cool things, um, inspired me to love equities and individual stocks and how to build them into portfolios. And uh, I'm just super glad that I met him and interned with him because if he wouldn't have kind of guided me in that right direction and given me like that really good, tough advice, um, I probably wouldn't be where I am at today. So I think about him often, probably weekly. <laughs> And I think that um, oftentimes the, many of us all come in, coming to work with, with a certain layers of idea, just like the CPA route that you were on, and not knowing that there are other wonderful uh, career paths, such as in the financial service and financial planning route. So at what point that you actually met your husband, that where your ex-husband, I mean, um, that you actually, did you guys created the business together or how, how did it actually come to that you have so many years of experience in terms of uh, merging several broker dealers? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, he's probably soon to be my ex-husband, but he's also my best friend. And I know that that's kind of a, an interesting story. We met when we were in high school. Um, we when I started working at Raymond James, he was like, wow, that sounds interesting. He was going to school for um, quality control management, but he loved the finance side of things. And so he started working in the branch with me um, when we were 20 and 21. And one of our advisors uh, left and went to uh, Sigma Financial up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And the thing I learned really early on was being an advisor in my 20s, my young 20s, I was, I was gonna starve. Um, I found myself very much in an operational role. I mean, your parents won't even give you their money. They know you too well, you know, at that age. And so you're trying to create all these centers of influence and be able to get referrals. But most of the people you know are in the same financial situation as you are and you're you know, um, kind of more debt heavy, you know, in your young 20s dealing with college and just um, cars and things like that. And so um, we ended up both interviewing up at Sigma. Sigma was looking for somebody that um, had a little bit of industry experience, but that um, could help them recruit advisors uh, to be able to grow their broker dealer. So they hired me for that position and then they hired Tony in on the trading side, because that's where his, his passion lies. And so for the last 26 years, you know, we were the fifth and sixth employee at Sigma Financial. We have helped uh, to grow this broker dealer um, into, you know, what it is today. We started Parkland Securities in 2002. We run the RIA side of things. And 
it's interesting um, because when you're running a broker dealer and you're running a client practice and you're parenting two children, our lives diverged a long time ago and we realized that we were better partners and friends than we were uh, spouses. <laughs> And so we we agreed uh, that that was a good route. And so it's such a it's such an interesting story because so much about our firm is about you know us growing up in that firm. But um, we are we are amazing friends and we're better we're better partners. So that's for sure. But uh, it's been it's been a great journey. I've learned a ton of things uh, through the past twenty six years. Um, most of them is all based around relationships and how you can expand, um, use them, and then look back on them and be so proud, you know, of what you've created throughout the years. And, and thank you for sharing that, that uh, incredible story that not that many people that I know of <laughs> actually started in the business as a first job. Very few that got into it. And, and, and you could probably attest to that since you have recruited more than a thousand advisors out there. Um, so I think that one of the two things that I, I um, found when you were talking about it was you knew at the very, very beginning, this is about relationship. And then you also knew that establishing center of influence is, is really the key. So would you be able to talk a little bit about, so what is center of influence? So for those of folks that who really haven't got into the idea of using center of influence as a way of doing business. So tell us about what is center of influence and then tell us about how did you go about doing your first center of influence? Yeah. So um, I've always looked at centers of influence is a relationship that you've acquired um, where you can benefit each other. And so that person has the ability to be an advocate, you know, for you in a lot of different ways. And so my first center of influence um, was when I was 20 years old and right when I got registered, um, I was trying to figure out, okay, I'm registered, I have licenses, I'm in this business, I have some knowledge and a lot of great mentors. Well, what do I do with that? How do I, how do I get people that have want, would want to sit, you know, sit down with me? And so, um, the very first thing I did was review what my parents, you know, retirement situations were. And my mother worked in a school system and I grew up in that school system and she was a, a secretary at a middle school. And I looked at her options of what she could invest in for retirement for her 403B. And I was pretty shocked, but most of the options back then were like group annuities and you know, with large insurance companies, but I didn't see anything like from a mutual fund standpoint or you know, anything that had lower expenses, th those types of things. And so I got lucky because my mother um, worked in the school system. And so the superintendent who made, so to speak, the list of the advisors that could work within the school district um, you know, with somebody she had worked for, you know, in the past, but even better, his daughter and I ran track together. And so I just reached out to him and asked for a meeting. And, um, I think he was excited to see me, you know, and this, you know, that next generation of your life, you push past high school and you're in college and having a daughter my age, uh, he, he took a meeting with me, which was, which was great. And I sat down with him and I had a presentation together. And back then, you know, we didn't have PowerPoints. I had a binder and, you know, things and plastic sleeves and all of that stuff, you know, showing mountain charts and all the different options. And I went in there with um, what I thought would be a tried and true um, idea for people who wanted to start investing. And that was with American funds. Um, American funds was what I found really early, a good foundational uh, piece, and it still is to most of my clients' portfolios. And uh, so I sat down and did the presentation and he said, all right, you're in. And he put me in to the school system so that I was one of the approved providers. And then I just went out on a limb and I reached out to every single person that had me as a student and asked them, 
you know, Good what they were you. doing for their retirement. Yeah. And um, thankfully, I was a decent student. So <laughs> they had fond memories of me. But even better, they all loved my mom. My mom was well, my mom at the time was this middle school secretary, and she was the core of that school. Everything ran because of her. She just had her hand in everything. And so they all knew me growing up because I would, you know, be doing my homework in her office when she was, you know, waiting to get out of work and things like that. So it was such a cool start. Um, and so many of those clients are still my clients today. And they would give me like $10 a week. It was like nothing to pay any bills on, but now I look at like their 403B balances and see them in retirement. And I'm so proud to say that they were like one of my first clients. Wow, such, a, such an incredible experience where a lot of folks may not know that your immediate family and even down to the school that you go to could potentially be a center of influence because a lot of time people might be thinking something even more uh, professional in terms of another professions uh, for that. So, so I, I love the story that the fact that is that your mom is the core of the center. That's like a jetpot of the uh, center of influence right. that everyone trusted her. And when she, when she uh, refer you to other clients, that's a, that's, that's a great story in terms of how you continue to build up the relationship, um, basically springboard from mom and then go on to other people within the school system. But I like the fact that you basically just knock on that person's door and say, and did your presentation and able to do that. Now, I do have to say that I'm, I was much shy compared to you, your situation, and I was a career changer. And I didn't necessarily have that kind of um, family background in terms of my parents are all in Taiwan and I was here. And it's really not necessarily that the situation that I have in terms of as a center of influence. So would you, would you talk about for people who may not have the situation like you had, what other type of center of influence could be an example that people could potentially explore? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, some of the early on, you know, um, my one designation I have is um, a certified wealth strategist that I did through mm -hmm. Canon Financial Institute. And that was a big part of the program was how to work with centers of influence. And so many times, um, we think it's like an estate planning attorney or a CPA and we get kind of boxed in and we go, okay, how many, how many CPAs and how many estate planning attorneys can I work with? Because it's kind of like a quid pro quo, you know, if you're, um, giving referrals to them, they're giving referrals to you, the situation works out. But if you have too many of them, you know, how, how is that going to work? And so what I loved about that training was they said centers of influence exist in everything you do. And the word influence sometimes trips people up. And they said it's more of like, it's like the center of relationships, you know? And so a lot of my clients that I worked with, I tried to look at where they were in their work structure and whether they had an influential relationship. And so a lot of times that I've worked with clients, I've been able to like look at them as a center of influence because my own clients have an influential structure within their workplace. And so when they're sitting around having lunch with somebody or talking to somebody and people are bringing up their finances, you know, they then become a center of influence for me because they can say, oh, I work with this great financial advisor and this is some of the things that we've done in the past. And so the Canon program really helped me to expand that. Um, also, I've sat on a lot of boards and, you know, like you said, you and I sit on the Women in Financial Services board, but prior to that, I sat on the FPA board and I've done some stuff with NAFA and things like that. In, in charitable boards that you're so passionate about can actually be the largest center of influence. It'll blow your mind because when you're going into something so giving, and wanting to help because that that part is so dear to you things just happen because of that you don't go in there with the intent of it being a center of influence you go in there of like you know um my mother um you know 
because of some health issues and things like that, I've become more involved in some of the, the uh, charities that she works with. And I'm going in there just thinking like, I just want to make, I want to do something to get rid of this disease, or I want to help out this charity in this way. And when you go in with that purity, it's amazing how people are like, well, what do you do for a living? And you could be with these people for months and you never, you don't know what they do for a living. We all just know we're here for this cause. And then you start talking about it and then it becomes so natural that I've even found Things like that have become such a great center of influence for me because um, we have something in common. We're both really excited um, about being involved, whether it's on a board or just even at the volunteer level to be able to do something that um, it just starts that natural conversation starter without even asking. And, and I think that those are really, really great points there. Center of influence is all about the relationship of the influence, right? Today, the social media has using the same word influencer, <laughs> but not necessarily the same kind of environment that we're talking about. Uh, but you're right, uh, serving on board or serving on charitable type of boards, it is incredible magnet because you are there for the same cause and then you are doing work literally showcasing how you work with clients without really selling anything. And so I, I really do agree that the serving, because I, I serve on the FPA board just like you before, um, and I serve on the Goodwill. And But I have to say that all these part of the pro bono works actually do bring in a lot more introduction compared to the actual marketing side of the things. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think that one of the things that in the industry oftentimes talks about the center of influence, you're right, we, are, we tend to be talking about the CPAs, the, um, the attorneys, right? right. Um, I remember I have established two insurance agencies, center of influence, both of them are property and casualty firms where I don't have any conflict and it is still serving the same natural markets and things like that. Uh, but that's a little bit different because the expectation is the referral process is, um, is both way. It's not, you don't necessarily just uh, go in and take their clients and things like that. So, so absolutely serving on the board. Um, and I believe that a lot of people, even just if the church or temple that you're involved in religiously, that could also be something that you can definitely help with. And I've seen so many people have gone through that route as well. So be using what the tools and uh, networks that you currently have certainly help with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, can we talk a little bit about from a value proposition perspective, if you are establishing a center of influence relationship, how does, um, how does, how does that benefit the other party? Because I always like to think about how do I benefit them first, how much they can benefit from, from me before I even ask for, for any type of referrals. So can you tell, help, help us walk through how do you pr uh, position that value so then your center of influence have the ability to naturally um, introduce you or influence people your way? Yeah, I think it's, I think sometimes we rush relationships, you know, and we ask for referrals too early, you know, and so that's, you know, we feel like, oh, I've, I've done this work for you, we, we get along, we've established this baseline and centers of influence, it's something that has to be like, it's foundational and it has to be like kind of loved and um, taken care of, you know, for, for a while before. Right you can actually have that person say those words. And I, and I think what is the benefit to them is that they actually feel that they're not benefiting me. And so that's the really big yes. deal with centers of influence. When you have clients or um, people that are using, you know, to advocate for you is that they're looking to help somebody that they care about. And there's nothing more important to them than to put them in hands of somebody that they know is going to take really good care of them. And I feel like, you know, that's the thing that's changed a lot with COIs or referrals um, is people are really careful on who they, you know, who they talk about. 
And so they don't just throw out names and say, oh, go check out Jenny. I think, you know, she's done a good job for us or anything like that. They actually talk about why they like working with me. What was an aspect of their life that I help them with. And sometimes it's not even financial. I mean, that the biggest thing about this career is the therapy <laughs> that yeah, goes yeah, the along therapy with it. Components of the, it. Yeah, yeah. the active listening um, right. and being able to hear what they're saying and then being able to give them the, the path or even the obstacles, you know, that could be in their way with that. And when you do that with people, they know you're just not telling them what they want to hear. Um, you're not trying to sell them something. And, um, and that relationship takes a long time. But what I have found with my COIs is that they don't actually expect anything from me in return. They feel that they're helping out the person that they're giving my name to. And to them, that's the most important thing. And I truthfully think that that COI relationship has changed to that in the last couple of years. And so it isn't this quid pro quo thing anymore. Like you do this for me, I do this for you. You scratch my back. Like that's just, that's just gone. It's all about um, truly helping somebody in a situation or helping them with a goal or their, or just their financial path, um, helping them get onto that, that right place. That's why when parents refer their children to you, that's how you know you, that you're you're there because they're doing that handoff of like this person's always taking care of me. Please help my children. You know, even on the small aspects of getting them to start investing, it's just they want to make sure they're on the right path. And 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 you're very true in terms of when your clients are referring you their children. That shows a lot of trust. And that trust and relationship doesn't take one day to build. Oftentimes, it, take, it may take years. Um, I've worked with my clients, children as well. It, it, it does take a while. And unless you are on the same page with that same, children, same child, if you will, um, you may potentially lose them. Because, because if you are the advisors for the parents, the children sometimes don't want to work with the same advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so you do have to have quite a bit of uh, um, trust and relationship in, in there. Um, would, you, would you be able to talk a little bit about, um, and I know that this might be a difference between men and women in terms of the COIs and referrals. I remember when I first came into the industry, there was really not that many women around in the industry, and I didn't have a, a women mentor uh, at all. And I remember the, my very first conversation about the, how to get the center of influence around was exactly what you talked about where there gotta be quick pro, pro, pro kind of situation. If I give you something, you give me something. D do you see the difference between how typical female approaches from the center of influence differently compared to a male? Or do you think that this is more of um, more, more of changing in terms of how you build your relationship in the industry. Yeah, it was interesting. I, um, I worked in an office, but when I started meeting with clients, I always gave them the option of coming to my office or for me to meet them in their home. And in my mind, I always felt comfortable walking into people's home because I felt like it also told a story that I might not get to hear, you know, within regards to their planning. Um, you know, some of them had home businesses, you know, things like that. But what I always wanted to happen, which I heard was the thing that never works long term is being able to get um, like the spouse, you know, to be involved in the meeting, getting the children to be your clients. So, you know, they talk about the boomers and how that money, you know, is going to be making that succession. And are you going to be able to keep that AUM or is it going to go somewhere else? And so very early on, I felt like if I inputted myself into their home, then I would be in a comfortable scenario for them. Whenever people come into an office, they kind of feel like maybe they're on a time clock. They might feel uncomfortable. Where's the bathroom? You know, all of that stuff. And so very early on, I I used like my female brain and was like, I just want to go into their home to where they're comfortable. And every single one of my clients, 
their kids are my clients because their kids remember me coming to their house. They remember talking about finances. Their parents never like shun them out of the room. I always brought them in as part of the conversation, you know, asking questions about where they wanted to go to college or, you know, different things. Um, and I also encouraged the parents to talk to them about the money that they were putting aside for them for college and things like that. And so it's, it's weirdly worked, um, but I have been able to capture that next generation of money. And whenever I ask, you know, why'd you pick me? They were like, my parents trusted you so much. They would like get so excited when you were coming over, they would get all prepped for the meeting, you know, make sure they had all of these things, you know, and they were like, it was, it was an event, you know, that happened in, in our house. And I know some advisors, you know, have really told me that I've made my life crazy because, you know, I go to them, I don't have all my tools right in front of me, you know, and things like that. But I truthfully believe that that's what's made me successful because that was my ability to show how much I cared about their family, not just, you know, their individual needs. And so um, from a female perspective, that is something that I just think came natural to me. And I think it comes pretty natural to most female advisors when I encourage them you know, to be in this business. And I talk to a lot of different college students that are looking at finance as, as a career. You know, I'm like, don't let anybody create your boundaries. You know, do what makes you comfortable. You know, if, if you wanna do presentations, that's great, but don't do them if they don't make you feel comfortable. If you wanna sit in front of people with questionnaires or blank pieces of paper or whatever, because that's how people can tell, like if you're authentic. And if you do something that doesn't feel comfortable to you, people probably aren't gonna get that warm, fuzzy feeling and start to feel like that relationship is building. So the best piece of advice I can give is do what makes you feel comfortable because if you are shining in that moment, um, people are gonna see that and they're gonna be attracted to it. And that's gonna make, that's gonna be the thing that, they, that are, they're drawn to. And, and, and you're right, the authenticity part of it does take, um, I don't know if it comes to you right away when you, when you enter the industry or does it, does it take a while to get there? I know that um, it didn't come that easy for me. So, <laughs> so it, it took a while for me to figure it out. And, and I like the fact that you mentioned about the, um, if, if there are certain, don't, don't let that boundary, don't let the firm's boundary limit how you present. Um, I do have one question regarding about, you mentioned about you going to clients' homes. I recall that because all, mo all my clients are business owners, so of course, I'm in their office. I'm in their office and I'm meeting their employees and, and things like that. Um, for, for today's environment, we know that we're all on Zoom and having meeting. Do you find it challenge or do you find it um, you have to operate differently in today's environment? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, Zoom, Zoom was probably really one of the hardest things <laughs> that I did in the pandemic, because you're right, I was used to creating that authenticity right across the table from somebody. So to try to create that um, over a video environment, um, very early on, like I had this like stark background behind me or this really office-y looking, you know, thing. And you know, behind me is pure chaos. And if you spend time with me, you understand that those two little people right there who aren't so little anymore are the, the biggest part of my life. And um, I think it's just when people, I, I had to take some of the things away that I thought was like Zoom protocol and wanted to like really make my personalities shine through and what, what I was about. And so, um, it's, it's challenged me a little bit because now it's kind of interesting. I was never a presentation based advisor. I was more of like a question and listening advisor. And then the presentation would come like way after, but now I have all these tools at my fingertips that as we're talking, I can go, Oh, let's, let's see what that looks like. Let me, let me throw that up on the screen. And they're like, Oh, that's so cool. And I'm like, yeah, if I change this number, if I change that. 
if we work a little bit longer, if we do this, this is what's going to happen. And I think it makes them also feel engaged because they're sitting either at their computer or whatever. And so they can kind of have access to everything to be able to kind of have that conversation too. So um, I think your, your, your style can come out. You just, you got to, again, get away from the boundaries because if you try to be something you're not on Zoom, it's going to, it's going to come out as well. As you know, Child Lee, this is my crazy self all the time. <laughs> so um, when I try to be too proper, because I don't, this is being recorded, and I don't know where it's going in the universe, then it's it's just not me. And if I rewatched re it, I would, I would probably be like, why did I say that? Or why did I do that? And so I kind of ditched, you know, all of those um, scared feelings about Zoom and then said, okay, what, what can I do to make this, you know, more interactive and fun? And, and it, it's been a journey, that's for sure. And, and I think that, that that is quite some, that's a very important aspect that you mentioned. I, I believe that in the industry, in terms of financial services or financial planning, that your speed to adapt whether or not is to client situation or technology situation or product situation or economic situation really makes a huge difference to your clients because your clients are looking up to you for some advice and the ability for you to, to, to immerse yourself into the Zoom environment, still having that interaction and engagement with clients, that's, that's actually quite incredible because it's not an easy thing to do a lot of the financial advisor as my client have told me that they have struggled at the very beginning in terms of how to use Zoom. They still go into their office, but they, they still use this. It took them a while to get used to that. But I think that over time, people start to realize, you're right, there is your personal personality still shine through. It really depending upon how you present yourself over the tech or leveraging the technology, if you will. Um, so thank you for that. And, and how, and we know that so center of influence and referral process, they all work in various different practice. How, what would you recommend in terms of helping people to integrate that into their practice? Meaning that it's not something that you do it at once, right? Like the school trips that you go to, it isn't a one time uh, trips that you go to, you, you kind of build that up over time. But how do you, how, how would you recommend people to do it if they haven't have center of influence or referral process in place? How would they integrate that into their own practice? Yeah, I think we tend to look at referrals, you know, that they have to come from an existing client you know, or they, or center of influence, it has to like integrate into our business. And some of the best clients I have ever had um, are on the sideline of soccer and volleyball games. Um, you know, and my kids always played uh, team sports. And so we would spend, you know, Saturdays and Sundays and practices and things like that. And we would just be hanging out. And a lot of us were working you know, we were sitting there with our laptops and, you know, and all of that. And what I think is we sometimes put too, you know, um, professional of a term on referrals and CLIs. And I think people need to just understand that the ability to market yourself comes everywhere in, in everything you do. It's how you, it's how you handle yourself at a PTA meeting. It's how you, handle yourself when you're, you know, like you said, I was a dead mom, you know, for, for Girl Scouts for, for many years when my daughter was earlier. I was around so many different professions, you know, just at like derbies and Girl Scout cookie, you know, environments that sooner or later, the conversation always turns to, what do you do for a living? And, and, you know, and it's kind of funny because that's the part that scares all of us, right? <gasps> oh my gosh, what do I say? You know, um, my Italian mother-in-law used to tell people that I sold stockings and bonds, Stop you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I had to crack up laughing because, but that's how she looked at, you know, and, you know, she immigrated to this country. She was so proud of her son and her daughter-in-law with what they were doing. 
but I'm like, so I sell socks and debt instruments, you know, I'm like, this is, <laughs> this is what I do. Um, but it's just that, that thing of being able to understand that you're always, you know, in that environment where you can make an impression on somebody and being able to do that, you know, people talk about your elevator speech, you know, what do you say to people, you know, and I think that that's another key thing that people just get so scared about, you know, they, they use words like, oh, I'm an investment, you know, I'm an accredited investment fiduciary, which I'm very proud of. But if I said that to somebody, they'd be like, okay. <laughs> and they would, they would never ask me a follow-up question. They'd be like, okay, that sounds really scary and smart. And we're just going to move, move on, you know, with that. And so, you know, what I, I spent years trying to say, like, how, how do I say that to people? What I do for a living. And, um, you know, so, so many times I've changed it up over the years, but, um, I, you know, I just basically, when people are like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I help people build wealth through our relationship. And they're like, what, what does that mean? And that's exactly what I want to have happen. I want it to want be, a follow up conversation. <laughs> I want that follow up conversation, you know, so that I can go, well, I'm very relationship based. I work with all of my clients and I help them with building wealth. And I'm like, and building wealth is building $1. You know, it's, it's just being able to go from being in debt, you know, to having a positive net worth, you know, people assume wealth is like millions and it's not wealth is, you know, being able to have something, you know, that you can call your own. And when you can go through that conversation and people are like, oh, wow, you know, so, but it has to be authentic, you know, and you have to figure out like what works for you. So the key thing I would tell people is, your world is your referral process and don't let it get limited by what marketing strategies tell you to do. Just realize that the people that you share something in common with are probably going to be the best clients for you because you automatically have something to talk about. So whether it's you're serving on a board or you're volunteering, you know, somewhere, you're sitting on the sideline, you know, at a sports game, you're a den mother, any of the things you do, you're part of a book club, anything you do creates that opportunity to talk to people about how excited you are about the things you do for your clients. And then that's important to remember is that exactly right. Everything everyone does, there is a there is a world surrounding you if you know how to tap into it um, and leverage that and just be yourself in the process, you certainly be, will be able to, to get a lot out of it. At the same time, you're helping people. And, mm -hmm. and like you, the, that one minute pitch, yeah, it took me a very long time to, to change over the year. And, and I, I still don't think that I'm perfect in that, but I don't think I need to perfect anything. <laughs> Take it Definitely as it is, right? <laughs> Definitely not. I still, when I say what I say, I'm like, oh, I could get better at that. Like, because right. when people ask me the follow-up questions, I'm like, ooh, that should be something, you know, that I, that I add. But um, that was something that Canon taught me as well was um, getting people to ask you, not making it seem like something you do doesn't require a follow-up question, but making it seem like, oh, intriguing, you know, like, oh, how do you build wealth? What do you do? You know, and that, and you know, the conversation goes awry anymore. I was in Utah last week, spending time with my son and his friends. And they were like, did you buy GameStop at 15? I was like, no, I didn't. I'm like, have you been in a GameStop? I haven't been in a GameStop. So I said, I never, oh, I, I owned GameStop like five years ago when Cam played video games. But I said, I haven't owned, but I know what's going on with GameStop. So if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it, you know? And so that's the thing. I sat in a room with 10, 19 year olds and we just nerded out about Reddit and GameStop and AMC and all that stuff. And I, and I just helped them to understand a couple things. I didn't try to over talk them. I tried to hear what they were hearing. And then the little parts they were missing, I was like, hey, what about this? And did you think about that? You know, and they were like, oh, I get it. You know, and at the end of that conversation, they're like, oh, are you leaving? And I'm like, yeah, I'll see you guys later. But it was just so much fun because 
sometimes I think we assume they know nothing because of the age they are and they know so much. They're so well read and they are, I mean, they teach me stuff so many times and it's just like, it's fun to be able to just be a fly on the wall in that conversation. Um, and, you know, they may go home and talk to their parents and be like, oh my gosh, Cam's mom, she she's the coolest. Like we were talking about all this stuff. Who's your financial advisor? Who do you work with? You know, and like I said, you you never know where anything can come out. One of the strangest referrals I ever got was I own a timeshare condo in Tennessee that my family has been going to every summer. And in the pool, we were just, you know, I've met families over the years and stuff. And one of the families was talking to the other family and they were talking about retiring and they're like, I'm retiring. I've got to move my 401k. I don't know what to do with it. And the one was like, oh, that's what Jenny does for a living. She moves money you know, <laughs> and stuff. And so How cool is that? <laughs> exactly. So the thing is, it's kind of interesting of how you're, you're like, we both said your whole world is your referral and you just got to be able to, um, to tell your story enough that people, um, grab little parts of it and are willing to extend it out to others. And I think that one of the things that I learned from our conversation is that not only you listen to people, you help, you naturally get people engaged by asking them the questions like what you were saying with the 19 years old that you were asking them, how about this and that? And I think that's really incredible skill set to have, not only, uh, and that's, I guess that's the basis of building the relationship, regardless about where the situation that you are at, you're continuously build, building that relationship and asking that uh, incredible questions. And, and when you were talking, I just thought about, wow, you are an incredible teacher really, really incredible teacher because you are always sharing information. You're always getting people engaged and they, you're always trying to help other people. And that shows a uh, true through your way of interacting with people and, and, and having that, that very solid relationship. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing all that. Uh, our, we have limited time and I wanted to ask one last thing and that is, if there's only one advice that you could give to someone who is either already in the industry or thinking about going into the industry, what would that be? Oh, it's, it's not about settling on one mindset. You know, this industry, I would say you have to be a sponge. You know, the, where I, where I started, I worked with an advisor, my mentor, um, sold stocks and bonds on a commission basis. And when he hit a thousand dollars in commissions, he went home that day. <laughs> and so it was my job to tell him when he hit that mark and he would wave goodbye and grab his coat and whatever clients called in the rest of the afternoon were my responsibility. And he was a great mentor. He taught me so much about research and why I would wanna own something and I use so much of what he gave me, but I've never charged my clients a commission <laughs> to buy a stock. You know, I work, you know, um, on fee for advice and, uh, you know, that's, that's how I do things. And I make it part of, we're in this together. And so quitting time happens when, when the last question is answered that day, you know, that, that a client might have of me, not based on, you know, my own internal goals of what that, what that day looks like. And so I have had 30 plus mentors in my career. And so what I've done is just listen to all of them. And some of those mentors have taught me exactly what not to do, you know, in this business. And so we have to like always not focus in on having the perfect mentor, but it's about having so many mentors that they can give us a 360 view of what this business looks like so that we have the ability to position ourselves in an authentic way in how we want to work with clients. And that has come from so many people. Uh, and I'm glad I was just open 
to listen to all different types of strategies, um, venture adventures that people have had in this business. So having plenty of mentors have a basically the very open-minded, if you will, to kind mm-hmm. of seek out how other people do things in the industry. And ultimately you have to internalize it for yourself because you have to be you, not all the strategy will work for you. And, but you have to do that effort in able to get it to work for you. So uh, thank you so much, Jenny. This is incredible. I wish we had more time to talk about this. I know that uh, being in the industry and as successful as you, time is really valuable. So thank you so much for, um, for coming through today in terms of the inter- uh, interview. Uh, we're so glad to have all of you as well at the Next Gen Mentoring Forum. What an informative session. Um, and I also wanted to have the opportunity to thank the uh, California Lutheran University School of Management Financial Planning Program for sponsoring today's Next Gen Mentoring Forum. And at California Lutheran University uh, School of Management, we offer MBA in financial planning, helps financial advisors pursue leadership position or grow their financial planning practice by deploying advanced financial planning, effective client communication, client counseling, streamlined practice management, as well as leveraging FinTech. Uh, Please uh, sign up for our info session for more information on our uh, program. And our next gen uh, mentoring uh, session is on March the 2nd uh, at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Please join me to interview financial expert, Julie Fortin. She is going to talk about a topic of how to integrating interpersonal neurobiology into financial planning. And thank you, everybody. Until then, we'll see you at the next Next Gen Mentoring Forum. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you.